Our text this morning is 2 Corinthians 5.21. 2 Corinthians 5.21. Someone mentioned a couple times my bolo tie. Are there any others here with a bolo tie today? I guess not. And someone mentioned that there was a camera hidden in here, but that's not true. It's not not true. Well, I'm amazed at how a big church like yours can can have a small church atmosphere. I, com- I commend you to your leadership for that. That's, you're all very warm and friendly, and that's wonderful. 2 Corinthians 5.21 is, I suppose, one of my life verses. I, I use it a lot with our youth on Wednesday nights, and I, I teach them for a while after we have joy club for kids from ages 5 to about 12, there's about 15 of those kids that come, and half of them, or more than half of them, are unchurched kids. And then, but after that, um, we're done with that about 7 o'clock, and, and then from uh, 7 to 7.30, we're cleaning up the church, setting things back up, and, and then so we study till about 8.30. And um, we ha- we're studying evangelism tool, but also um, we get to... They get to interact with me, and, and this is one of the verses that comes up so often. Well, it's in our evangelism tool, uh, as far as Christ became the only Savior. And this verse is directly focused on Christ being the Savior from sin. Uh, Paul had to defend his ministry often. And in, in the book of Second Corinthians, we see it happening quite often because he didn't like to do that, but he had to do that because he was being the, the used of God to pen the very breath of God, the scriptures, and, and as a result, why he had to defend his ministry or, his, or the word of God would be discredited. And so in this particular setting here, we're going to start with verse 17, he's defending the message of his ministry. And some of that message is reconciliation. So follow with me as I read to you verses 17 through 21 of 2 Chronicles, excuse me, 2 Corinthians 5. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature or a new creation. The old things passed away, behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling us Reconciling us, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though Christ were entreating through us, we beg you on behalf, as though Christ, for Christ, as though God were entreating through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him, God made him, made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. There have been many extremely serious plagues in the world. For example, in 1347, a Mongol army from Mongolia besieged a trading post at a place called Kaffa in Crimea. You probably heard about Crimea on the news last night because of all the trouble going on in Ukraine. They threw bodies, this army did, threw bodies of bubonic plague victims over the town walls. They used catapults to do that. Those who were defending the city were terrified, terror-stricken, And they fled to Italy, those who could escape, and they took the dreaded bacteria that caused the plague. It went with them. For three years, it spread all over Europe. That epidemic became enormous in its extent, and it became known, as you maybe know, the Black Death. And before it was over, as many as 20 million people perished. That was about a third of the population of Europe at that time. It would occur again in a number of years following, in the centuries following, until the antibiotics were developed in the 20th century that brought it under control finally. That's probably the most well-known epidemic in history, but there have been some since. For instance, 
1918 and 19 in, the, in America, there was an influenza epidemic which took more lives than the Black Death in Europe. Some 30 to 40 million, my source said. Typhus has killed several million in Eastern Europe about the same time as that influenza uh, epidemic. Many other infectious diseases have taken who knows how many millions of lives, like malaria and yellow fever, and in my lifetime, AIDS. And a few years ago, like 10 years ago, there was a new threat on the horizon, a, um, at that time on the horizon, a new bird flu epidemic. Um, but it never really did become, as much as I can remember, it never really did, did become full-blown. A lot of these plagues from diseases are not as horrible nor as widespread. Not even if you put all of them together, they aren't as widespread or as deadly as what one Puritan writer called the plague of plagues in which every person is infected. And it's 100% fatal. All the plagues I listed only result in physical death. This one results not just in physical death, but also in spiritual death, eternal death. It's called the plague of sin. Adam's rebellion plunged the human race into sin. Romans 5.12 says, For by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin. For death is passed upon all men, for all have sinned. David said in Psalm 51, In sin my mother conceived me, not because he was illegitimately born, I don't think he was, but because from day one we are sinners. Psalm 58.3 says, The wicked are estranged from the womb. Those who speak lies go astray from birth. And then in 1 Kings 8.46, Solomon at the dedication of the temple said, There is no man who does not sin. And later in Proverbs 20, Solomon said, No one can say, I have cleansed my heart. I am pure from my sin. No one can say that. In Genesis 5, we see over and over again that people were, were born and, and he, a certain man had lived a certain number of years. And he he uh, had, had a son and he lived hundreds of more years having sons and daughters and he died. And he died. Eight times it says, and he died. Because of sin, there's not just spiritual death but, or physical death, but spiritual death. Alienation from God. An endless punishment in the lake of fire. Sin is the worst epidemic. Man has found a way to check many of the plagues, but man has no way to check the sin virus. He is utterly helpless, utterly helpless to check the sin virus, that deadly sin epidemic. But God has a remedy. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I know how that's preached here and taught here. And you know that the gospel means good news. It is the remedy to man's ruin. God's grace and mercy provided it in the substitutionary sacrifice of his son, and that's what this verse is all about. The Apostle John said in Revelation 1.5, Our Lord released us from our sins by his blood. And that word released could be translated loosed or set free or untied. Man couldn't remedy the most deadly virus in the world, the plague of sin, but God could and God did. As I read to you that scripture, you could see that it comes at the end of that section on reconciliation. The truth of God reconciling man to himself. Man is separated from God. Sinful man separated from the holy God, dead in sin, is brought to God by being given new life and forgiven of sin, cleansed of the plague of sin's curse and penalty. And it's all done through the Lord Jesus Christ, one person, and what he accomplished. I love to to talk to others and love to speak to others about the person and work of Christ. But how can this take place since God is holy? How how can God do this? Man is utterly sinful. How can there be a reconciliation? How can the just demands of God's holy law be met? Because it condemns, it punishes all who violate it. 
How can its holy demands be satisfied? Do we deserve mercy and grace? No. So how do we get it? Can the demands of God's justice and love both be met? How is it that God can be just and the justifier of sinners, Romans 3.23? How how is it that God can be righteous and and he can also make other people righteous and declare them to be righteous? And eventually he does make us righteous. But salvation, he declares us to be righteous. How can that be? This one verse gives a brief, succinct answer. Short, but in the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, it's packed with marvelous truth. And you'll probably hear me using the word monumental truth. I happen to like some of those big words that are strong. Okay, I'm the emotional type. You can tell that. I'm the exuberant type. I like those kinds of words. But I also know that the Holy Spirit of God and all of us who preach must continue to remember that only the Holy Spirit of God can draw people to himself. Yes, I believe in passion, and I, I believe in preaching with passion. But it's only by the Spirit of God that people will come. So this is, this is marvelous truth that res- resolves the dilemma of unholy man being reconciled to a holy God. This is the heart of the gospel. Here in a few words is the, gr- the glorious truth of how man's sinful state is restored to our holy God. There are three great truths. There are three monumental truths to instruct us on how God did this. First of all, the sinlessness of Christ. Secondly, the substitutionary sacrifice of Christ. And thirdly, the supernatural exchange provided by Christ. There are three statements in this this little verse. The sinlessness of Christ that qualified him to be the substitutionary sacrifice for Christ, or sacrifice for sin, uh, resulting in a supernatural exchange. Three great truths on how God remedied the world's worst epidemic. I'm going to have you go with me to the book of Hebrews to start with. There are four strong testimonies, or four writers, shall I say. Hebrews has two strong words about the sinlessness of Christ. But that's where we want to start, because in 2 Corinthians 5.21, the original in the, in the Greek New Testament, it starts out like this, the one not knowing truth, uh, excuse me, one not knowing sin, the one not knowing sin. And so we start with the sinlessness of Christ. Vitally important when it comes to being, rem- to being uh, delivered from the, the greatest epidemic, the most deadly epidemic the world's ever known is the, the sin virus. Uh, start with Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. We don't know the author of this, or I would have given his, given his name, and I don't even want to speculate. Some people give names of who it might have been, but I'm not even going to speculate. I've just put down here in my notes a writer of Hebrews. In verse 15, it says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Right there is a great statement on the fact that Jesus couldn't sin. But yet he was tempted, wasn't he? he? He understands temptation, even though I don't believe he could ever sin. He couldn't sin. Yet he understands temptation because he made us. He understands what sin has done to us. And, and people will say, well, well, how could Jesus be sensitive or understand our, our temptation if he never was able to sin? But he was tempted, and the Bible says that. He was tempted to create into bread a rock. You've never been tempted to do that because we couldn't do it. We're tempted with lots of bread, aren't we, men? We're tempted with bread to eat over, to overdo it. Jesus was tempted, honestly tempted, to create because he could have done it. But I ought to make that rock or that stone into a loaf of bread. But I don't believe Jesus could sin. Because John 5 says that Jesus can only do, the Son can only do what the Father does, and the Father could never sin. But he understands sin and all of its manifestations because he's seen it. 
And I'd like to suggest to all of us, those of you who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, he is your substitute. The more holy you become, the more you walk with the Lord, the more you become like Christ, the more sensitive you will be to sin. The more it's going to strike you, and the more sorrow and the more grieving you're going to do over your own sin. So Jesus never sinned, but he saw it in all of its manifestations. He had a great sensitivity towards sin, but he was without sin. Hebrews 7.26, turn there for just a moment. Hebrews 7.26, a couple pages over. In this verse, he makes four statements regarding Jesus' sinlessness. For it was fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Great statements on Jesus' sinlessness. The Apostle John in uh, 1 John, 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. And remember, the Apostle John was next to Jesus, very close to him, always referred to himself, not by name, but referred to himself as the apostle whom Jesus loved because he was so amazed that Jesus would love him. And so he knew the Lord Jesus. He saw him in all of his activities And he said, in him there is no sin. In him there is no sin. There was no disposition to sin. Jesus had no habits of sin to overcome. When we get to glory, that's one reason why we've got to look forward to heaven, because we won't have all this habits of sin to overcome. Because there will not only be delivered from the, the, the penalty of sin and the power of sin, but even the presence of sin. Amen to that. Jesus said in John 14, 30, that the prince of this world is coming, but he has nothing in me. He had nothing in Christ that he could charge him with, like like the devil does to us. In John chapter 8, Jesus said, who of you or which of you convicts me of sin? No one could. People tried, but they all ended up falling far short. The writer of Hebrews said he was without sin. John said there's no sin in him. Let's look what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 22. And by the way, Peter's quoting here from Isaiah 53, verse 9. Who committed no sin, he committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth because there was none in his heart who committed no sin. He did no sin. No sin in him. Now let's go back to 2 Corinthians 5. This is the other testimony, and it's Paul's testimony, that he knew no sin. That doesn't mean that Jesus didn't know what sin was. Like I said a moment ago in I forget who, where I found that one, but he, he knew sin. He knows sin. He's seen it in all of its manifestations. I thought that was a great statement. He who knew no sin, but he knows what it does. He knows what it does to us. Some of his enemies, those, let's, let's say those were his friends. Some of his enemies... Like Pilate said, I find no guilt in this man. He said that a couple times in Luke 23. Pilate's wife in Matthew 27 said, have nothing to do with this righteous man. Judas said in the same chapter of Matthew, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And the dying thief who was, was an enemy but became a friend, converted there on the cross, said to his counterpart, we indeed suffered justly, For we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And then that Roman centurion, another statement out of Luke 23, said, Certainly this man was innocent. Literally, it's the word for righteous. This man was innocent. The sinlessness of Christ is what qualified him to be 
the substitutionary sacrifice for sinners like you and me. And I know I'm taking a lot of time on the sinlessness of Christ and less time on the other points. But I do that because I'm, I'm continually reminded how important it is to think about that truth and that it would never, and I pray in my life, it would never be treated nonchalantly or commonplace. Every time we, we address the sinlessness of Christ, talk about it or read about it in the scriptures, may we be, be reminded of some of those men in the Old Testament, like, like Moses, who stood at that burning bush, and, and the Lord talked to him out of the burning bush, and the Lord said to him, remove your sandals, for you are on what? Holy ground. That's kind of where I feel I am when I present something like this. Because it goes way beyond us, doesn't it? That someone, a man, a person on this earth could be totally without sin. That boggles the mind. And, but what's so, what's so tragic is that people, people want to deny that because they want Jesus to be, come down here more to be like with us. And yet they're perverting the very truth, the only truth that can really save their souls, aren't they? They deny that. But not us. So proclaim that truth from the housetops. The sinlessness of the Lord Jesus Christ. That was exactly what qualified him to be the substitutionary sacrifice because God demanded holiness and his word or his law was holy, is holy. And Jesus said in Matthew 5, 48, be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Ouch, I don't qualify. I can't accomplish that. We all need a substitute. Because we are a bunch of lawbreakers of God's holy law. We break it all the time. In fact, if you just break it in one point, James said, and the James that wrote that was Jesus' brother, who came to believe in his Messiah, in the Lord Jesus, his brother, after the resurrection. He said if we break the law in one point, we've broken the, the whole thing. So we need a substitute. We need someone to stand in our place, and that's what the substitution is all about, the doctrine of substitution. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. On our behalf means in our place, in our stead, in place of us. That word, or the verb, to be, is not in the original, which makes it even more impactful it says, because literally it says God made him sin. That's not a verb, that's a noun. God made him sin, like what some people, they translate it, became sin. And we talk about that. I've used that phrase. He became sin. And he did. But some people preach that he actually became a sinner. And that's not true. He didn't become a sinner. We just studied that, we just saw that he was, a, he was sinless so God would not make him a sinner. But I remember a very well-known evangelist when I was younger uh, was waxing eloquently on, on Christ's death on the cross and the doctrine of substitution. And I remember him saying very strongly with his hand and his voice that, Christ, that God made Christ a murderer. God made him a, a liar. God made him a thief. God made him an adulterer. And that was that were really uh, impactful. I, I thought about that for weeks. But years later, I've come to the conclusion that God did not make him a sinner. The best way to see that is he treated him like one. He treated him like one. There are those today who are in the word faith movement or the word of faith movement who say that when Jesus' body was in the tomb, his spirit went to hell and he was beat up and kicked around by Satan for a while because he was a man that was a mortal man that needed to be reborn. That's not in the Bible. Don't, don't listen to those guys. And Please do not send those people any money. Don't do that. Christ is the only, the only Savior 
that's what I put on my prayer card. And I borrowed it from somebody. We preachers borrow lots of things um, from others. The Bible is the final authority, and Christ is the only Savior. The only Savior. And we're learning today how he became qualified to be that Savior. Let me give you an Old Testament picture of the fact that, that uh, Jesus was innocent. He never committed sin. He wasn't made a sinner. He was totally innocent. In the Old Testament, when a man brought uh, an animal as a sin offering or trespass offering, he would lay his hands on that animal. And it symbolized the, his sin going through his hands into that animal. That animal is not guilty. That animal never became inherently evil. That animal was totally innocent. That animal un, was undeserving. And then when that was done, why, the priest would, would kill him, kill the animal. What a picture of the Lord Jesus sacrificing himself for undeserving, unworthy, and guilty sinners like us. But that's what he did. That's the wondrous love and mercy and grace of God bringing us to himself because of what Christ did on the cross. That marvelous doctrine of substitution. Galatians 3.13 says, He became a curse for us. Ooh, He wasn't cursed. Where was the curse? On us. He took the curse. He bore the wrath of God on himself. But the best one, and I did not think about this. I was going too fast in the first service. But Isaiah 53, you don't need to, how about, I, I just read that to you. Isaiah 53, this is the best. And maybe you saw years ago that, that film, The Passion of the Christ. I went to see it just because I wanted uh, people uh, to be able to talk to people if they asked me about it. Uh, you don't need to ever watch it. You don't need to ever watch the video. You don't need to watch it. You, I would say don't. Um, and at the, at the beginning of that film, there was a verse on the screen. There, there was no talking. It was all subtitles. But it was Isaiah 53, 5. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. Every single one of those lines has the doctrine of substitution in it. But the tragic part of that film was they never explained what that verse meant. But it did give an opportunity for some of us to answer people's questions. Why did they do that to the Lord? Why did they do that to Jesus? Well, we could take them. Well, remember that verse at the very front of the the movie? That's a doctrine of substitution, and he was a substitute for sinners. Because we're lawbreakers, and we need a law keeper. A couple of um, men said it rightly. I told you a moment ago, but I want, I want to read some quotes now to show you that this is not unique with me. He was not a sinner. Christ was not a sinner, but God treated him like one. Back in the 1930s, Archibald Robertson, a great Greek grammarian, said, God treated as sin the one who knew no sin. But even before that, almost 100 years before that, Charles Hodge said in his Second Corinthians commentary, The sense in which he was made sin is that he was regarded and treated as a sinner. I I like that. That's that's a great great term, great way to say it. And isn't it a miracle that that when we come to Christ by faith, and it, it is our responsibility to repent and believe, yet at that very moment, Christ, we are seen by God, our sin is seen by God as being on Christ on the cross. And Romans 6 helps us understand that a little bit. Because there is a, another great subject, and I know you men and women here who teach love this, to talk about the union that a Christian has with the Lord Jesus Christ. We are in union with him. Romans 6, 4, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized, immersed, not by water, but immersed into Jesus Christ, have been baptized into his death. Therefore, we have been buried with him through his baptism into death in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Water baptism is an excellent illustration of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, of us being identified with him in his death, burial, and resurrection. What a union we have with Christ. I trust 
that you're thinking about that if, if you need a substitute. Maybe some of you here do need a substitute. Well, let's go a little further back to, in uh, 2 Corinthians 5. The sinlessness of Christ qualified him to be the substitutionary sacrifice which resulted in a supernatural exchange. I told you that, that Jesus was not a sinner, but God treated him like one. He treated him as though he committed all of Rex Heckel's sins and everybody else who will ever believe in all of time. God treated Christ on the cross as though he committed all the sins of all those throughout time who would believe. Now it says the last part of the verse is that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Christ was no sinner. We are not righteous. We, we can't make that grade. It's not possible. That's why we need a substitute. We're a bunch of lawbreakers, unrighteous lawbreakers. We need a lawkeeper. And that was Christ. That supernatural exchange, when belief takes place, there's that miracle of, of being clothed in his righteousness. God sees us in the righteousness of Christ. It's not our righteousness inherently. It, it, it came from him. It's his. It's still his. When we get the glory, it will still be his. Even though we'll be glorified. Be without sin, finally. But what a wondrous transaction. And I want to read to you the uh, verses of a song written back in, in uh, 1987 by a man named Luke Garrett, who also sang it. He wrote it with a couple other men. And I, would, I think I'm going to recommend to, to Marika that she learn this song. I think she should sing this one for you. A victim on a cross of execution, the Lamb of God that sacrificed his life and the sky grew dark. The rain poured down. The price of my redemption was so high. For on that hill was done a great transaction. As God paid out the ransom for my sin. And I walk away. I am truly free. From the prison and hell my life has been. I stand before the mighty king of glory. A servant who is guiltless in his sight. Though I am to blame... I've been redeemed from the sin for which my Lord was crucified. And then the chorus, a wondrous exchange, a wondrous exchange, an offer so great I can scarcely believe, his crown for my shame, his loss for my gain, his death for my life. What a wondrous exchange. The remedy for the world's most deadly virus, the SIN virus, as one preacher called it, is the sinless life of Christ, which qualified him to be the substitutionary sacrifice for sinners, resulting in the supernatural exchange provided by the death of Christ. Mr. Spurgeon, and I, I feel comfortable quoting him because men quoted him this week at the preaching conference. The sum and substance of the gospel lies in that word, substitution. If I understand the gospel, it is this. I deserve to be lost forever. The only reason why I should not be damned is that Christ was punished in my stead, or in my place. There's no need to execute a sentence twice for sin. On the other hand, I know I cannot enter heaven unless I have a perfect righteousness. I am absolutely certain I shall never have one of my own. For I find I sin every day. But the Christ had a perfect righteousness. And he said, there, poor sinner, take my garment and put it on. You shall stand before God as if you were Christ. And I will stand before God as if I had been the sinner. I will suffer in the sinner's stead. And you shall be rewarded for works which you did not do, but which I did for you. A number of years ago when one of the teams came, I don't remember what year it was, but the girls from your church sang uh, Amazing Love. 
And the chorus, I, I remember the chorus, I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted, you were condemned. I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. A couple of responses. For those of you who, who know Jesus Christ is your, is your substitute, there's no doubt about that. You are assured that he is your substitute. This doctrine of substitution should bring from you, should draw from you great statements about gratitude and thanksgiving. In fact, energetic, thunderous thanksgiving. Every time we dwell on this truth, may our thanksgiving thunder forth with greater and greater enthusiasm. We are heaven bound. What a wondrous exchange. Christ cured us from the most deadly virus. Another response I want to encourage you with is is that this is an inspiration to obey. We have Christ's righteousness. He clothed us in his righteousness, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He gave us that righteousness. But in salvation, he's also making us more and more righteous in a practical way. And so if we've really been given the righteous life, or God treats us as though we lived the righteous life of Christ, isn't that incentive to live in a righteous way? May the Spirit empower us to live this way. Yes, it's sacrifice in this kind of world that we live in that takes denying self and sin to live righteously, but then what did Christ do? He sacrificed for us. Can we sacrifice for him? Yes, we can. And living a righteous life is a sacrifice. I pray that this doctrine will move you and me to constant thanksgiving and a consistent holy living to glorify our Lord. And then, to all of you who are lawbreakers and you have not yet surrendered to the call of God, May God call you today to himself. Because you see, your sin is going to be paid for. All sin will be paid for on you throughout all eternity in hell, and it will never quite get paid off because mankind can suffer for eternity and still not pay it. Or you can have your sin paid for on Christ on the cross. So I appeal to you. In fact, let me give you this testimony. Let me tell you what happened to my sin that bound me and was condemning me and kept me separated from God. When I surrendered to the call of this good news and of his sacrifice, acknowledged my sin and called out to God to save me in Jesus' name, my sin, that most deadly virus which afflicted me, was put on Christ. I was delivered of the guilt and the penalty and was made a new creation in Christ. Would you like your sin to be placed on Christ? There's only one one other option. Your sin will stay on you throughout all eternity and you'll suffer in hell, separated from all that's good and gracious and merciful. Christ bore sin. May the Spirit of God bring conviction of your sin upon you, and may God's Spirit give you that energy to turn from your sin, because you cannot do that on your own. May God give you that energy to turn from your sin, to belief in Christ, and be delivered from the most deadly epidemic, the sin epidemic. May you be delivered today. You see, those of us who know we're headed for heaven, we want you to come with us. We want to see you delivered from that deadly plague of sin and be on your way to heaven with us. Bow with me as we pray. Our Father in heaven, We thank you for this time together today, for the young people leading us in in music as we worship you, and music, and as Pete read the scripture, and 
as we gave, we've, we worshiped also in our giving. And I Lord, pr- trust, Lord, that we've worshiped you in the highest way, and that is paying attention to your holy word. Lord, thank you for the message of the cross of Jesus Christ. And I pray for that soul today that's here in this room that has never surrendered, never turned from their sin to Christ for eternal life and forgiveness. Lord, help that person to do that today. And Lord, the rest of us, may we go from here being renewed in that sense of forgiveness and newness of life because of seeing the sinlessness of Christ and his sacrificial death on our behalf and seeing that that supernatural exchange. Thank you, Lord, for your righteousness that we so desperately needed. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.